let's talk about the holidays. So, I left home like at 15 and a half because I thought I was a big girl and I just thought my dad was a jerk and, and he was done. <laughs> Until I realized years later he's the smartest cat on the face of this earth. Uh, ultimate respect for my daddy. Brilliant man. Um, Navy captain, very proper. Uh, both my parents were quite proper. Um, and I, I had a very good upbringing. It's just, when my parents split up, I had to kind of like raise my mom and my grandpa and my baby sister. And it was just a very adult world. And we were raised to be adults anyway because my parents always had business meetings and stuff. And uh, they always told us children should be seen and not heard. So we weren't allowed to speak unless spoken to. Because they were always discussing business. We just were dressed very beautifully, went to very nice places to eat and meet with people, and my parents conducted business. So anyway, uh, and they always said we were just little angels. <laughs> but when I left home, I think one of the saddest things was, you know, when I was real young, you know, seven and younger and all that. My parents were still married. Um, we had, you know, a very gracious, brand new built home my father had purchased, being in the Navy in Seal Beach. Um, and uh, my grandfather was over there helping setting up the landscape and all that because it was just dirt. And uh, we used to have all of my mother's family because they all lived in California. My dad's family is southern so they were all in Oklahoma. And so my mother's family is huge. She was the last of 17 kids. And uh, so we had cousins and aunts and uncles and all kinds of stuff. And so my mother would throw these big gracious parties for the holidays, Thanksgiving or, you know, Christmas, and I mean, it was just, it was just unreal, the, the stuff, and my mother would rent a champagne fountain, and so you just walked over there, and you put your glass in the fountain, and it filled it, and it would just keep pumping, it was just really beautiful, and, uh, the food and everything, and mother would cook all that food and stuff and it was just a really big thing and it was so neat because you got to see your cousins and aunts and uncles and, and meet new relatives in the family and it was just there were huge parties and then sometimes we'd do like New Year's at my grandfather's house and sometimes at Thanksgiving and he had this huge huge table with all the chairs, everything, and everybody would come to Grandpa's house, which, you know, was a farm originally, a chicken farm, and, um, uh, in Artesia, and, uh, my grandmother, uh, prepared the chickens for the chicken dinners for Knott's Berry Farm, okay, so, you know, we would have, you know, some celebrations over there, and so when I left home, I, I was last living with my father, and we did not get along that last maybe two years and I was like so gone. I left at my own will. He said, if you can't do as I say under my roof, then there's the door. And he said it so many times and I just was so sad and going nowhere. And so I decided I was a smart cat and I would leave because he was stupid. And trust me, I should have stayed till I was at least 18. If I could have made it, I should have really done it. Um, back then was easier, you know, you could get fake ID, you could get into clubs, um, you could get jobs, you know, people told you all the illegal wrong ways to do things so that you could work for a living and support yourself and make really good money. Um, now I'm not saying I was a hooker or drug dealer, it's just, I worked, the money was at, in food and beverage where I lived in California. 
huge money if you got into fine dining, seafood, steakhouses, um, you know, high quality Italian food, the hotels, working the hotels, uh, doing banquet service, bartending, that kind of thing, and country clubs. And so, you know, my big dream was to be a bartender. I thought, boy, that's it. That is the job, you know. And uh, instead of running around in circles being a cocktail waitress or a food mover, but anyway, um, so, you know, the, the holidays were rough. You know, I would call my daddy, and he was always traveling around the world. He might be in Hawaii. He might be in England. He could be just anywhere. And the people that work for him don't know who you are, and they treat you like dirt. And it's like, he's my daddy. And they're like, yeah, sure. And so, anyway, you know, you ask where he's at. They don't want to tell you. You got to call three people that work for daddy because you know them personally and, and, and they'll tell you the truth and so you can't get a hold of them unless you call him by marine radio because he's sailed somewhere so or flown somewhere so anyway it was kind of sad one of the first Thanksgivings I remember I was um, uh, one that really affected me I was uh, bartending in the strip clubs because they were checking Organic money wearing a tuxedo with a bow tie so I didn't have to do anything the girls did all the dancing and all that stuff and so um, I was making like 400 a shift just in tips and then I made my pay which was usually 70 to 100 a shift and a lot of them just paid me on the table which was really cool but not cool because now you don't have any retirement um, so anyway uh, I was staying with a friend of mine. She'd offered me a place because I was kind of in my car. I was going through a separation with Bill West and um, and then uh, uh, he, he stole the car that I, I bought for him. <laughs> so I had no car and he was always in the hospital or in jail. So then I became carless, so then I managed to buy a car, dirt cheap, my little convertible Fiat, which was my love of my life. What a great car. And so I uh, um, was sitting there, and it was Thanksgiving morning, and, and I was staying at, uh, we used to call her Ass Annie, as, as a girl that worked at King Henry's. And uh, she had given me a free place to stay. And I would just fill the house up with food. I would clean it. And it was a garage that was made into a, a bachelor pad apartment. It was really nice. Really, really nice. And the girl up front, her name was Pepper. She was a dancer at King Henry's. She's a black girl. She was a character. Um, and she later got really hooked on drugs bad as the years went by. Um, and uh, she, um, uh, I, I was sitting in the house, you know, I had made a call and I knew my dad was out of the country. And I was kind of sad thinking about the old days at Grandpa's house and, and, and our home in Seal Beach and all the people that would come and getting to see my cousin Rusty and my Aunt Elaine Wing from. Nebraska and all these different people, my Aunt Doris and everybody and you know those were really neat times and um, I mean huge huge family gatherings, I mean we're talking like 50, 75 people used to come to our house in Seal Beach and then there was probably you know 30 people that used to come to Grandpa's house um, including their kids no matter how big or small they were, Grandpa welcomed everyone and we just went wild. Grandpa's house was like a giant maze to Disneyland. Big old southern home. A southern style home in Artesia. Like plantation home. Um, I went there years later and it seemed so small. Uh, I tried to buy it. But anyway, so I was 
sitting there in Annie's house and Annie was gone. She'd gone out with somebody to go have sex, whatever. And she was also dating the guy that owned, well, I guess I can say it now because his wife is deceased. He's still alive. She was dating Erwin, the owner of King Henry's. And, and uh, that was kind of obvious. Um, and uh, his wife was an evil witch. Oh, Jesus. Renata was a witch. So, anyway, um, he's still alive today. He ha he owns a big ice skating rink out in Harbor City. I tried to catch up with him when I was in California recently. And he It was one of the days he wasn't there. I would have loved to have seen him. And he was a great guy. I worked for him for a while. And a really great guy. And uh, so he's from Germany. So anyway, um, I think their name was Heindel or Heidel. Erwin Heidel. Erwin and Renata Heindel. Heidel. Like that. So anyway, um, Annie was gone. You know, Pepper was probably asleep. She had a lot of kids, so she always, you know, was up early in the morning and she had her kids dressed to the tee and clean and ready to go off to school. You know, and her house was always immaculate. And she was really proper. Very, very proper. Oh, there's a truck up here. I wonder if I'm going to be able to get through. Oh, it's a trash bin. So, look at these things I think are ready to rent. Or the people bought them. Townhouse things. God, I can't stand a townhouse. So, anyway, um... So anyway, uh, I'm sitting there by myself, and I want to hide, okay? And I can't remember if Annie had a phone there or not. I'm thinking she didn't. And uh, that's back the days where, you know, people didn't have car phones unless they drove a Porsche or a Rolls Royce, and they paid big money to have a phone in their car. Um, so... I'm sitting there and I'm getting kind of sad because, you know, like, where did all that go? Just because I left home, why is it all ended? So, uh, you know, it really hit me hard because I really enjoyed the holidays when I was little and growing up. <coughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, um... And that leads into another story. Uh, my friend, uh, Pepper, everybody was knocking on the door and stuff, you know. And I didn't want to answer the door because I was embarrassed because I was alone for Thanksgiving. Because people always say, oh, you're going to go be with your family for the holiday and, and all that. And, uh, you know, it's like, no. Like why? And it hurts, you know. It really, really, really hurts. So, uh, I thought, well, maybe I better get used to it because it might be for the rest of my life here. You know, it was my grandfather who just passed away, and so that was the end of that. My aunt Eleanor hijacked his house years before that. Made him sign a document. She said it was for insurance. You know, signing the house over. I was there for that. What rich people will do to hustle their parents. So anyway, uh, you know, and my mother was out and about wherever Hawaii or California, something. So I never knew where to find her. And, uh, uh, you know, my dad was out of the country in England or something. And I have nobody, you know. I have absolutely nobody. And nobody will invite you to Thanksgiving because you're not family. 
Why would they do that? That's like totally inappropriate. You know, back in that day, it was just absolutely inappropriate. So, uh, then all of a sudden, somebody's climbing in the window. Now, this area wasn't the greatest area. It was not far from the from the club from King Henry's. Um, it was um, like three three streets down from King Henry's and uh, off of Crenshaw. And uh, so it wasn't the perfect area, but you know you had to be careful your cars and and your house um, as people would break in. And I made really good money back then. So um, anyway. Uh, Somebody's climbing through the bathroom window. And it's uh, Annie. And and I was freaking out. Like, you know, I had a picture knock in my hand. And it was Annie. And she goes, oh my God, I almost got stabbed. And I'm in my own house. And I'm like, uh, so what are you doing? And she said, well, we were wondering what you were doing. I was up front with Pat. And, uh, we were wondering where you were at, if you went to go, you know, with your family, with your dad or whatever, for the holiday. And I said, no. I said, well, what are you doing? And I said, um, hiding. Because I don't want people to, you know, say, how come you're not with your family? And, and I don't want to answer it because, you know, I left home. It was my choice, and now I gotta live with it. And I'm sitting here thinking of old times, and uh, you know, I just uh, just gonna try to, you know, wait till midnight when this is over. <laughs> and I think the club was actually closed for the holiday too, so there was nothing to do. So. And Annie says, you need to come up front to Pepper's house. Um, you know, she's uh, doing a bunch of stuff, and you should really come up front and hang out with us. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. So, then Pepper comes back there about two hours later. And um, she says, what are you doing, Red? And I said, well, I'm sitting here. She said, you need to come up front to my house. I need your help anyway. And I said, with what? She said, well, I'm doing some stuff and I need your help. I said, well, sure. You know, I mean, I never denied anybody help. Hell of a stand there free. And, you know, everybody was helping me out. And, you know, uh, the good thing is I pretty much always worked. And wherever I worked, I made good money. So, anyway, I'll be in peace and look at the ocean. So, anyway, um, I went up there, and, and I've done a vlog about this before, the best Thanksgiving ever. I had my black Thanksgiving. And uh, so, um, I got dressed and nice and stuff, and... And because, you know, it's a holiday. That's what you're supposed to do. And so I went up to her house. And uh, actually, it was better to be around people. Um, it really was. Um, so if you know anybody that doesn't have family nearby and it's a holiday, do check with them and see if you can hustle them into coming over or whatever. Because some people have a lot of problem with it. And you get a lot of suicide rates um, during the holidays, and there's no reason for that. People don't need to be bailing out just because of a holiday. Um, there's always some place to go for that. They have, you know, Thanksgiving dinners free in bars and churches, and um, uh, you know, there's always somebody around. So don't don't leave a friend out. You know, it's really important. Um, I gave away many Thanksgiving for years at my own home, and uh, because I, I try to love everybody, you know, and not everybody has a place to go, or they're from 
somewhere and their families went another state and and it's just there's no way for them to go back they can't take off of work they don't have the money to go and so share the love you know and um gotta love everybody that's what makes the world go around not money or anything else it's love compassion and love so anyway i ended up hanging out with pepper and annie and we were cooking stuff and i had never seen people cook like this I guess what you would call like a southern black Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they they grind up the stuffing instead of little cubes. They grind it up and pour it in there kind of like a milkshake. And then they cook it and it kind of looks like a cake. And, and they do a lot of different things. They don't do pumpkin pie, but they do sweet potato pie. And they both look the same. Really, they do. They're both orange pies. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to tell you, sweet potato pie is so much better than pumpkin pie. Um, but anyway, so we were doing that because she was going to have a Thanksgiving at her house. Now, in her family, which is, you know, all black, uh, what they do is, you know, everybody comes over to her house. They do Thanksgiving. And they might come together, they might come, you know, an hour apart. But you, most of the day is there. So when the relatives finish going to her house, then we all get in a car and go to the next house. And so this girl I worked with, uh, she used to ride a bicycle to work all the time and danced. And, and it was, I felt sorry for her because she always rode a bike. And this girl pulls up in front of the house honking the horn. She's got the most beautiful white Cadillac Seville with a spoke rims and whole deal. And I'm like, you know, hey, Pep, somebody's honking out in front of the house in a white Cadillac. She said, that's sister or my cousin or something. And we went out there and it was that girl I worked with. I can't think of her name right now. And I love the hell out of that girl, the, the girl that rode the bicycle. She's so sweet. And so we all got in her car because Pepper's like, come on, you got to go. We're going for a ride. I'm like, to where? Don't worry about it. Just come on. So we all pile in the car, go to another house. All black people. And I got Thanksgiving. They're all welcome. I mean, I walk in the door and they hug me. I don't even know them. And it was like, wow. And these people were talking to me like they'd known me years and just treated me like gold. I was like, wow, these are really nice people. They just like me for me. Not because of my clothes, my money, where I work, anything. They just like me. Why couldn't everybody be like that? So, then we left that place, and you got to, you know, check their food out. That was the interesting thing. You, it was like taste test. You go and you have, you know, they say, the Thanksgiving's in the kitchen. Go get your own plate. Go get it. So, you'd go in there, and you'd get some stuff, and you'd eat, and everybody'd talk for a little while, and then... Then you get in the car, and then we go to the next place. And, you know, black families have a lot of relatives. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> so we spent day and night drinking and eating at all these different relatives of Pepper. And uh, until we got back to the house, and, and it was just the most beautiful Thanksgiving holiday I think I've ever had in my life. I call it my Black Thanksgiving, where people really cared and didn't want you to be alone and you didn't have to be family to do it. And they loved you unconditionally and did for many years. Um, so that was really neat. So as the years went by, I, I had started dating Ronald Fournier and I dated him for a lot of years, and uh, he was from Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, I worked in the clubs bartending. And I, I remember, you know, I always had to work the holidays. If you're working in the food and restaurant industry, they don't want to give you a day off, and you better not ask for a day off or they're going to fire you. The only one that gets away with that is one that's doing the boss, and they get away with everything. Um, they never get fired. They can be late, absent, you know, take off, and you can't, you can't make a move. 
You have to do everything. So, and the holidays are usually slow, but you have some big tippers that'll come in through you, you know, 20, 50, 100. Just because you're there and they don't have any family or anybody to go hang out with, so they come in the bar and they drink. Because they're sad, you know? It's better than being home alone. So I worked for years during the holidays and Ron would call me at work and I'd be crying behind the bar. He's like, I miss you babes and wished you were here, you know. The boys wished you were here and it's like, yeah, I know. And it was like, when will this all end, you know? Why, why can't I be home for the holiday, you know? Um... So it went on for years. It was really, really hard. It's, it's, you always had to work the holidays. There was no leniency in California. Um, you were lucky to have a job, and you better keep it because it's hard to get another job because you got bills due, and they're not stopping. And and you've got to keep paying them because you don't want to go through the disconnect thing and all that mess, and it's a pain in the butt. So. That was the saddest thing about the holidays. I've worked them for years, and then to the point where it just didn't bother me. It was just accepted. It was just like, you know, I always worked the holidays. And then, you know, in you know the latter years, the holidays were always the biggest money. You were a fool if you weren't working the holidays, especially in the gentlemen's clubs. Um, you were an absolute fool if you didn't work at it. Plus, for the sad girls that, you know, had no family, you wanted to be there for them. And, you know, I've, I've had 200,000 girls across the United States call me mom for years and years and years. And that's okay, you know. Um, and treat me like gold. I've had them call me 24 hours a day, text me 24 hours a day. Um, matter of fact, I stopped, like, six girls from committing suicide. Because I was there at 3 in the morning. Because they wanted somebody to talk to. And I didn't turn them away. I couldn't. I love people. And I was proud of that afterwards when I found out. You know, I'd see a girl like a month later and she'd say, you know, you saved my life that night. And I'm like, huh? And they're like, I was ready to bail and you were there for me. And I'm like, well, of course I'm here for you. I'm here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No matter where I am in the United States or the world, I'm there for you. Don't hesitate to call me. Life is such a precious thing to waste. And um, uh, I'm just there for you, man. And and they're like, I really appreciate you. And that, that helped a lot of my business through the years because I, I, I'm real, you know. Um, I love people. And people will spend money with you if they really, really like you. It's truly a southern thing, I think, a lot of it. In the south, it's like do business with people that do business with you. And so, um, you know, that's a big thing in the south, you know. Um, you don't want to do business with anyone but people that, you know, do business with you. And it's like a return favor, you know. Oh, I don't want to go there. I'll drive farther to go to this other place because these people do business with me. Um, you know. So, I mean, when you're in California, you just buy from wherever. But it's the South. You try to stick with the people that, you know, you deal with. Um, it's returning the favor, you know what I mean? And so, um, that's the thing about holidays and that. Um, so, I used to make the biggest Thanksgiving dinners. I did a vlog about the purple turkey you should listen to. It's pretty wild. Um... And living home and trying to cook <laughs> uh, serious meals. I could cook, but I was not a pro on cooking a turkey dinner. But anyway, so, um, you know, when Ron and I were together, you know, the boys used to always bring people home from the, from the job sites, working in construction with their dad and stuff. And it, it was always some stranger loser kid that had run away from home or, you know, some guy that was in his 20s that was homeless living in his truck but working um, or just broke up with his girl and got thrown out of the house and, you know, had no place to go. So they would always bring, you know, somebody in for dinner. And I always made gracious dinners every night. 
I always made a lot. I cook for an army, and it's a habit. It's because you don't want anybody to go hungry. If somebody comes in your house, now in California, it's an insult if you interrupt people at dinner time. They absolutely get infuriated if you're calling them or banging on their door during dinner. Um, and it's really embarrassing, you know, when they're mean to you. So I did it different. Um, you know, when the boys brought people, you know, with them to hang out for a little bit at the house or whatever, um, I looked, always told them, hey, if you'd like to eat, we've got plenty because I always made enough for army. So we always fed whoever, you know, they brought in the door. And um, uh, even if it was a neighbor from one block down, um, I always welcome people. Please, you know, you know, get a plate. And so uh, I do that with stray dogs, stray cats. I do it with everything. <laughs> I just don't want anybody to go hungry. And uh, so on the holidays, I would make huge, huge Thanksgiving dinner when Ron and I were together. And um, he would be at work. I'd spend all day cooking. And I would make like five different kinds of pies. And two different kinds of stuffing. And all kinds of stuff. Uh, all from scratch. I didn't do any canned stuff. I didn't even do canned cranberries. I made those fresh too. And uh, always had a ton. And sure as heck, there was somebody at the job site that was homeless or something. And, and, you know, Ron or the boys would say, you know, can we invite so-and-so? And it's like, yeah, give them a call. Please give them a call. Please tell them to come spend the day with us. Because I'll never forget that Thanksgiving with Pepper, my black Thanksgiving with Pepper and Annie and all those people. Um, because I was really sad. And um, it makes me cry now because I remember exactly how I felt back then. I was so embarrassed that I had no family to have Thanksgiving with, but I made the choice to leave, you know, it was kind of like no turning back, I created my future, so now I had to live in it, so, um, always reach out and take care of the folks, especially during the holidays, make sure that people are not alone for the holidays, okay? Make sure to tell people, don't say, are you gonna be with your family this year? Say, hey, because you already know they have nobody or their families in New York or wherever. Make sure to tell them, hey, look, you know, I'm cooking a whole bunch of Thanksgiving food. I got so much food, I need people to eat it. Could you please come by on Thanksgiving day? I would appreciate it or I'm gonna be feeding the stuff to the fish. Okay. Come up with whatever you can go 